Seeing none, uh, member statements? Uh, member from Ajax Pickering. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Please speak about the importance of World Stroke Day, celebrated each year on October 29th. And World Stroke Day is a chance to raise awareness, share stories, and learn to prevent this illness that affects so many. Stroke has been and continues to be a widespread disease afflicting over 15 million worldwide each year. Speaker, promoting World Stroke Day is significant because the date has now become a high point for efforts focusing on prevention. And this year's theme of World Stroke Day is face to facts, stroke is treatable. World Stroke Day serves as a valuable reminder how important it is that we build on the work done and help people learn what they can do to prevent stroke and recognize the signs and symptoms of a stroke and get treatment quickly. Living a healthy, active lifestyle free of tobacco is the first step speaker towards reducing one risk of chronic illness. Although it is a complex disease, stroke is treatable, and I urge Ontario residents to take action to drive that awareness and push for better access to stroke treatments. We in the Ontario Progressive Conservative Caucus join the Ontario Stroke Network and other health partners in helping to improve awareness of prevention techniques and treatment options. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. I thank the member from Whitby, Oshawa. And it's now time for member statements. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I don't think anyone in this room, anyone in this province, relishes the prospect of freezing in the dark. But certainly, as a result of the ice storm in December of 2013, many, many Ontarians had an opportunity to do that. It's one of the consequences of the extreme weather that's brought on by climate change. In 2009, Speaker, this government had a report back from an expert panel on adapting to climate change, and one of their recommendations touched on the assessment of risk to the electricity system, recognizing that increasingly extreme weather was going to knock out that system. That recommendation in 2009 was ignored when the government brought forward its Climate Ready Adaptation Report a few years later. And in 2013, when the ice storm struck, it was very clear that the steps necessary to make sure the system was continuing to function hadn't been put in place. This week, I had a chance to question the Minister of Energy on climate change adaptation. It's clear that that recommendation from the expert panel continues to simply sit on the shelf. And to the extent that it does, it means that we continue to be at risk either for shivering in the dark or sweltering in a city with no electrical power. Speaker, there are real consequences to ignoring climate change. This government is ignoring it. The Liberals have set down a course of action that will bring us into conflict with those threats. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from uh, Brampton Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, one in two Canadians is eligible to donate blood, but only six, one in 60 give. This year, Canadian Blood Services launched the 100,000 New Donor Challenge to donate across the country. Every November of each year, the people of the Sikh faith come from around the world donate blood to commemorate the memory of the innocent lives lost during the atrocities of November 1984. It is one of the largest blood donation campaigns in Ontario and in Canada, saving over 113,000 lives. On November of each year, the Sikh community around the globe reaches out and embraces the vision that all humans should live a safe and happy life. The blood donation campaign led by the Sikh community makes you look at the history and the future as well. This campaign brings all humans together as one. With the vision of bringing people together around the globe, the Sikh community first started the blood donation campaign at the Lower Mainland of British Columbia in 1999. The campaign has now grown across Canada, the USA, Australia, and other worldwide locations. The Sikh, donation blood camp, Sikh Nation blood donation camp has globally saved many lives in each of these respective countries. The Sikh Nation Blood Camp is a part of an effort to raise awareness of the events and the atrocities of 1984, and at the same time, unite humanity to end such atrocities across the world. The Sikh Nation Blood Camp campaign embraces the Sikh and the Ontarian and Canadian values by expressing peace and inviting people around the world to participate in humanitarian campaigns. 
This campaign remembers the innocent Sikh victims of, an, of the atrocities in November 1984, and in memory of these lives lost in 1984, a moment of silence at 6 p.m. on November 1st is absorbed every, observed every year. I invite everybody to, to join the upcoming blood camps in Brampton this weekend. Uh, thank you. Uh, further member statements, the member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I met with a group of concerned Ontario doctors to discuss the constant decline of the health care in Scarborough. Scarborough hospitals have been pushed to a crisis point. Their emergency rooms are overcrowded, and the infrastructure is old and crumbling. They are faced with the growing challenge of how to better serve families with fewer resources, how to better serve patients with fewer staff. One doctor shared a story about a patient who was brought to the emergency department because he was feeling too weak to walk. His symptoms were vague, uh, too vague, but he was sick enough to be admitted to the hospital. There were empty rooms and the beds in the emergency department that night, Mr. Speaker, but the patient was told that he could not have them because the hospital could not afford to pay for a nurse to nurse him. Therefore, the patient sat in a chair for more than 20 hours that day. Mr. Speaker, this is totally unacceptable. People in Scarborough deserve a healthcare system that actually delivers. I strongly urge this government to stop neglecting Scarborough's health care needs any longer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Hamilton Baldwin. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, black youth came together to participate in Hair Story, a project of the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth. Hair Story invites black youth to share their experiences with government services and the challenges that come with being racialized in these systems. On Monday, I had the privilege of taking part in a listening table where these stories were courageously shared. I hear their call for more understanding about their cultures in all of our systems so that they can feel understood and included. They spoke of how their social workers didn't have the ability to meet their needs. They expressed the failures of child protection services, which operate as a business from nine to five. We all know that the care for our children and youth goes far beyond a nine to five job. Youth do not have the supports to transition out of care. Our system abandons them. These youth entrusted myself and the government that we would act on these issues. It is the duty of our government to make sure that government services do not discriminate against cultures or ethnicities. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further members, statements. The member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. Merhaba, Gunaydin. Um, Speaker, Turkey is, the, is a dynamic and vibrant nation that straddles the part of Asia called Anatolia and the part of Europe called Eastern Thrace. Turkey is both an ancient society and a strong and a modern nation. Alexander the Great governed Turkey, as did Roman Emperor Constantine, after whom Istanbul's ancient name of Constantinople arose. Turkey's history is long, rich, and deep. Turkey has drawn enduring lessons in civilization, science, architecture, engineering, religion, and military history together to build uh, an empire in its own right. Turkey showed all of the great powers of the 20th century that it would not be interfered with. The father of modern Turkey is, of course, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who led the new Republic of Turkey that arose from the old Ottoman Empire. We celebrate Republic Day of Turkey on October the 29th of each year. Turkey is a nation whose past has taught it what fights to join and what disputes to stay out of. It is a staunch NATO ally. These proud, confident people are now a part of Ontario's multicultural fabric. We join with our Turkish-Canadian friends, neighbours, co-workers, and on our, our Ontario family to celebrate Republic Day of Turkey. I am joined by my colleague, the Honourable Reza Maridi, and also to thank our Ontarians of Turkish descent and their families for helping build today's and tomorrow's modern Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in the House today to celebrate the Turkish Republic. 
The Republic of Turkey was founded by the great Turkish leader Mustafa Kemal Ataturk on October 29, 1923. The young republic emerged after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the First World War. After that war, Allied forces divided and occupied Turkey. Ataturk was a brilliant military leader who mustered the Turkish forces and liberated his country in 1922 in the War of Independence. In 1923, Ataturk established Turkey as a secular democratic state. It was the first democracy in the Middle East. Ataturk enacted many progressive reforms which brought the Turkish people out of superstition and tyranny and into the 20th century. He promoted the use of an elegant new alphabet for the Turkish language and favored clear and precise expression. Ataturk ensured equality for men and women. He promoted higher education and international trade. Since then, the modern Turkish Republic has been a beacon of secularism and democracy in the Middle East and is one of Canada's greatest allies. So I hope you will all join me in celebrating 93 years of the Turkish Republic. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you. As the holiday season approaches, I want to speak about our neighbours and constituents who do not have enough to eat. No one in this province should be going hungry, but inadequate social assistance rates perpetuate poverty and hunger. This is why we, the need for food banks persists in our province and is going up. If you have to pay rent and bills, buy clothing and feed yourself on $706 a month, it's almost in inevitable that you will have to turn to food banks for help. The number of children in Hamilton needing emergency food assistance is actually going up. According to the 2016 hunger count, it has increased by 5% this year. We have actually 6,000 kids going to school hungry. There are excellent food banks in Hamilton, and one of the main channels for donations is through the Hamilton Food Share. Hamilton Food Share provides much needed food supplies and short term uh, storage to local food banks and hot meal programs. I'd like to thank and acknowledge the Hamilton Food Share, their community partners, and Hamilton's local food banks for everything they do for our neighbours in need. I encourage all of us, MPPs and citizens, to do our utmost to reduce hunger in this province, both through legislative action here and through directly supporting emergency food assistance programs. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from the Public North. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to share with this House some of the remarkable developments that are going on in the riding of Etobicoke North uh, because of the extraordinary ambition, dedication, perseverance and long-suffering member of Etobicoke North, $1.7 billion worth of development in the riding. A $90 million facility, a student facility at Humber College, which is really an architectural jewel. We have eight new stops. Count them, Speaker. Eight new stops. Uh, the Finch LRT, Humber College, Highway 27, Westmore, Martin Grove, Albion, Stevenson, Kipling, Islington. This speaker in itself is a $1.2 billion development. And most especially, perhaps, re and just recently, a $358 million uh, upgrade, renovation, redesign, uh, quadrupling the footprint of Etobicoke General Hospital. Uh, this is a, for example, part of it is a four-story wing, 250,000 square feet, uh, larger state-of-the-art emergency department, critical care, intensive care units, maternal newborn, birthing suites, new ambulatory procedures unit, cardiorespiratory, neurodiagnostic. As uh, was said on the day of the opening, it is a monumental day for the Osler healthcare system, in particular, Etobicoke General. Uh, all of this, Speaker, I think is great news for our residents, whether it's from health care, from transportation, for building the future education of our province at Humber College, the Finch LRT, as well as at Etobicoke General Hospital. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. I thank all members for their statements. I do